All right, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 220 of the uh, the security podcast on the N30 Network. My name is Haim. Tom is right there in the lower box. Not the big box, the lower box. Okay, so it took one, we had one uh, misstep, but this is the second misstep, the first, the first correct one so far. We are working on it. We got this less than six minutes now, and it only took two takes. So yep. <laughs> much better, much better. Because again, with Google Hangouts on air, it would record it. And if one of us forgot to record, it was okay. And you probably couldn't tell because the Google audio was actually really, really good. So, so I'm happy. I'm actually really surprised. Like I, I expected Hangouts on air, like their audio to be like, not like trash, but not good. Uh, but as it turns out, it was almost indistinguishable from our local recording. So, hey, that's WebRTC for you. So, look, it's, uh, I really wish we, we're still pouring one out for Google Hangouts, but we, we seem to have moved on. If Google Hangouts magically came back tomorrow, we would be really happy. But, I mean, we're okay for right now, and I think that we can move this along fairly quickly and, and get this down to just a minute or two. So anyway, let's just move on. Let's jump right in. I don't know if we covered this last week, but last week Google's Project Zero found, not Tavis, but I think Ian Beer, found 14 critical zero-day vulnerabilities in iOS in some crazy fashion where you had to daisy-chain them to make them work. The problem is they were being sold and actively exploited by fairly big sites that they uh, want to keep. Um, they don't want to name just for whatever reason. So if you have iOS, uh, Apple issued a patch, you can update and you should be fixed. Yeah, it, uh, these exploits were not trivial. Like the, the stuff that Project Zero was dropping, I couldn't follow it. Like I, I kind of got a little bit of what they were talking about, but honestly, it was super in-depth. It was super technical. They were like decompiling and looking at assembly code. They're looking at memory jumps uh, and explaining everything, as far as I could tell, explaining everything perfectly, but not in such a way that a layman like myself could understand. Um, so feel free to check out the, uh, the Google Project Zero blog if you really feel like delving into assembly, but um, you know, just know that an attack like this, uh, these were exploit chains that were extremely sophisticated, like state level actors of sophistication. It, honestly, it, it blew my mind just looking at it. Um, so yeah, uh, keep patched. I mean, it's the, the, the key phrase was websites with quote unquote thousands of uh, daily visitors. So I don't know what that means, but I mean, who, who, the idea is is that they were buying this from somebody. Now, the good thing is Project Zero, I guess, got it for free, but imagine they knew about it. They could have easily taken and sold it and made millions upon millions of dollars through the black market sale on the site. So with that said, though, I found an, an interesting segue is that now Zerodium, which is those black market, uh, that black market website, is paying now more money for Android exploits than iOS exploits, meaning that a, a Pixel phone, like if you have a pure Google Pixel phone, Pixel, Pixel 2, Pixel 3, the 3A, probably essential phone, you are probably safer than iOS. But again, take that with a grain of salt. We're talking about, we're extrapolating from the fact that one company is paying slightly more for Android exploits than iOS exploits. Uh, and it, it could also be just a you know market share thing um, <clears throat> with iOS devices quickly rising cost. And uh, I mean, Android devices are kind of getting there, but for the most part, you can buy Android devices way cheaper than iOS devices in most markets. Um, if you want an exploit that's going to hit the vast majority of users, pick the one with the biggest market share. I mean, you have to remember, as much as we talk about Pixel phones and everything else, we're talking maybe 5 million people worldwide have one. I mean, Apple sells 40 million a week on, on iOS, and everyone has iOS. So and the thing is, Apple always complains, hey, we don't have dominant market share. We have 40%, but that means 60% is somebody else. That's Android, so go after them. But there's so many different flavors of Android. Most of them, to exploit something, you're only exploiting a small part of the market. But again, it's just, it's one of those things. It's this cat and mouse game. 
And the key there is just to stay as current as you can and make it a point to only buy phones that will stay current, whatever that means to you. But for me, that means I'm either going iPhone, which I probably will end up going, or staying with the Pixel on. Yeah, it's it's also, um, it brings up an interesting segue uh, that having a monoculture, having only one segment of technology in any, any portion of the market is usually a bad thing because if that market segment, if that one thing that's ruling the entire market falls apart, or if there's a vulnerability, now everyone's impacted. A at least right now, you know, when, when these massive uh, exploit chains were figured out um, against iOS, that, you know, it's only affecting about half the market share, right? The other half is completely unaffected by these exploits, which is good. That's what you want. Uh, but imagine if any one player controlled the entire cell phone space, then with one really well-crafted exploit or an exploit chain in this case, uh, you could own quite literally everyone, which would be you know, super bad for very obvious reasons. Uh, so monocultures, kind of inherently dangerous. Um, you know, I'm not saying that you take one for the team and you go buy a BlackBerry or you dig out a Windows phone somewhere, uh, but it's important that there's there's at the very least some balance between competing parties. Look, it's uh, I've been really happy with Android for X number of years, and I have really no reason to switch except for the fact that I have Mac literally everywhere else. And I figure, and after Tom moved saying, look, I can use reminders and it goes everywhere, and I'm not sold on iMessage because I, I'm perfectly happy with WhatsApp. So, I mean, for me, it's just the fact that I have Macs everywhere, that's the reason for me to even think about changing. Yeah, it, I gotta say, the iOS integration, super nice. It's really, really, really nice. Um, I'm a convert. Uh, I've, I've been, I don't really wanna admit this, but I bought into the AirPods, I bought into the Apple Watch, like, I'm there, man. I'm, I'm there. I'm going full iOS at this point. Look, I just want USB-C, but we talked about this because I have USB-C. If I was still on Lightning, I would buy the last iPhone, I would buy the last Lightning iPhone, hold that for as long as humanly possible, and then make the transition. But I'm on the other side. I have USB-C, so I'd much rather wait till it's USB-C and then go all in. But yeah, I don't know. I think I, I, I don't, the rumors are we're going to hear something tomorrow, but I have a feeling it's not going to be USB-C. It's going to be probably next year. So I got another year. I'm okay. It's okay. Yeah. And so, uh, if, if you're in the market for an Android phone, uh, I think we can, you know, without really any reservations, recommend the Pixel 3a. It's always 3A. better to get, yeah, it's always better to get your phone directly from Google and it's what, 400 bucks? I mean, that's. Yeah. For a flagship device, that's extremely cheap. It reminds me of the old Nexus style pricing. Uh, so yeah, Pixel 3a, just go buy it outright. Look, I the mean, I think it's a lot of money, but it's cheaper than a thousand dollar iPhone. Look, I was at the water park a few weeks ago. So, and the question was, wait, my Pixel 2 XL is waterproof. That's what it says. But yet, I'm not going to dunk it in water. Like, so it sounds like it's waterproof to to the toilet, but not waterproof to the water park. And then for $8, I can get two pouches that go over my neck to protect it. So, and the reason I'm saying that is the Pixel 3a is not waterproof, but I'm sure in your case, uh, it will it will take a few splashes, but they say it's not waterproof. And But it has a headphone jack. So for $400, you get no waterproof, you get a headphone jack, you don't get wireless charging, which, uh, I had never used, but I think people now are starting to like it. I just think it's too slow. I really do think it's too slow. Yeah, I, I haven't personally used it, but um, I kind of gave up on my wireless charging dreams. Maybe one day, but uh, but not this cycle. Um, I do got to say, though, uh, with any kind of waterproofing or damage protection on the phone itself, uh, most of the time, like, you, you will pay for this privilege. But most of the time, you can make up for those phone deficiencies with buying a pretty nice case right get get something life proof uh the otter boxers are always well reviewed i've got an otter box on my iphone right now and uh, i i just destroy devices and so far the case is held up to me so i'm pretty happy with it i mean i would if i didn't have kids i would roll completely commando on my phone but i have kids and they like to bring me my phone as a nice gesture which means that they often drop it but 
I will tell you that I really like the little. I, I know I'm, I'm I'm showing my age, but I'm, I like the little ring at the back that I can put my finger through, and I'm not putting that on an expensive phone. Yep. So so anyway, we talked about that. There's nothing more to say other than update your device. It's not a you problem. It's an Apple problem. When it's an Android problem, it's an Android problem. This is not something you can prevent. There is nothing you can do. That's why there's zero days. That's why it was so bad. But we can move on. Um, then our main topic, and we have a third topic, but our main topic tonight is about a month old and it involves ransomware. So we talked about ransomware, but now what's happening is there's a bunch of ransomware that's targeting municipalities and schools and uh, government organizations. And and mainly we're talking about one, how to protect, but two, these ransomware writers are finding out that the insurance is just paying out. And it goes against complete like FBI guidance to not pay the ransomware. But the fact that the insurance companies are paying it out is saying that they've decided that it's easier to pay out than to decrypt and do everything else or to find backups and rebuild it, which is an interesting saying. And now it's the how now these ransomware writers need an actuary to figure out how much that they can actually extract like let's get to one penny less than that that number so they can get more money. Yeah, it's um like I we don't want to ever get into the business of victim blaming here, right? These these are attacks. It says it's quite literally a digital mugging. Um <clears throat> so what these ransomware authors are doing is they are writing and deploying and targeting ransomware attacks at these places because they know that they're going to get paid, right? Um, if if they just kept attacking somebody who said, yeah, we don't negotiate with terrorists and stop paying, right? The ransomware would just disappear overnight, but that's not what happens. Uh, what happens is these firms will go out and they'll buy insurance or they'll pay a firm um, and the firm and the insurance will, will pay out. Uh, the ransomware authors will get paid, the files will get decrypted, and you know nobody is happy about the exchange except the malware authors, but they got paid, so why would they stop? Um, it's a dangerous, dangerous precedent. I don't see it stopping anytime soon, uh, just because you, you can't really legislate against these things. You can't uh, yell at you know, these various institutions for paying, because if they don't have backups, what else are they going to do, right? If, if you're a school system and you've lost all of your student records, if you're a government and you've your DMV is just shut down because all your stuff's encrypted, are you just going to say, I guess we're getting rid of all the parking fines and license plates? Like, I don't know. Hmm. I, I guess everybody just drives for free now. Sorry about that. Uh, no, you, you can't do that. There's no way. So, of course, you're going to pay the bounty. Um, it's just... It's painful all all the way around. And in concerning these institutions, especially governments, schools, um, they usually don't have giant IT budgets, right? Uh, I've I've worked with a, a few of these people uh, or a few of these types of institutions, and it's always a shoestring budget. It's like trying to get computers that are more than like six years old for for their staff to just do their jobs is is like pulling teeth. Um, so, you know, talking about backup systems and redundancies and, uh, you know, maybe paying for blinky boxes or dedicated security personnel to make sure that everything's on the up and up is just unrealistic. It shouldn't be, but the reality is most of the time for these places, it is like putting in just, just a simple rudimentary backup system that runs once a week could be cost prohibitive, uh, for some of these local municipal governments or, or local schools. Uh, I mean, I, I, you can, you can speak about the school budgets more than I can, but I know at least for one of my school districts that I've worked with, you know, just trying to get teachers like notebooks and pencils and protractors and just classroom supplies was way too much of a demand for the budget, let alone a digital backup system or, or any kind of security. Well, so this year they rolled out uh, each student literally today got a device and we were talking about that, but they got rid of what we call the old F drive. The F drive was where the students can save some their home directory. And they're just now OneDrive. They're, you know what? We're just going to pay Microsoft. We're going to do OneDrive. And they're going to hope that Microsoft's going to deal with it. So like you said, they're paying insurances. So our, 
our website that we're working on. Some company is coming in and they're giving us the, the quote unquote insurance that it will stay up. So basically because public, uh, public institutions, schools and municipalities are bounded by all these requests, Anybody who pays taxes can see what their taxes are going for. So if you want to see body cam footage of the police department and they're backed by ransomware, they are now in non-compliance, which may cost them even more. So they take insurance out on all this, and that's the problem. They probably have an IT staff of one. I mean, the IT staff at, at, at I mean, our school probably is, let's see, I mean, we probably have 15,000 students, 15,000 people in our school district, I mean, with an IT staff of 10, I mean, that's that's not a lot for what we have. At our building, we have two, two people at the high school. So the elementary schools are probably sharing one. So, and they have to do all of this. They have to secure everything. So, the, and all it takes is one phishing email, one HR sounding employee to say, here, check your paycheck and you open up an Excel document and you have macros enabled and now the entire company is under, uh, is now encrypted and there's nothing you can do. Yeah, it's, what makes ransomware so dangerous is that there's not really a great way to protect against it, uh, at least not right now. Uh, there's a couple things that are in flux, like you can you can look at malware signatures, but if it's something new or uh, if it's something that you know, has just been altered in a way to avoid signatures, which is you know basically rule zero for writing malware, um, it's not going to help. Um, you could try to look at you know who's opening files. It's an opening a lot of files, but you know then again. Uh, you open up like an IDE or a sufficiently large program. Well, that's doing the same thing. Then you're getting into program whitelisting and executable whitelisting. Like it's, these problems are not trivial to solve. There's no fire and forget solution. And more importantly, uh, there's no free open source solution that somebody can just hit a button, deploy to their network and make themselves immune from ransomware. The only real defense we have against ransomware right now is keeping good, consistent backups that are, that are backed up often uh that are not uh that are either write only um or uh, i'm sorry uh, append only uh <clears throat> or completely separated on the network uh because there have been cases of municipalities hospitals whatever where the ransomware actually encrypted the backups yeah that doesn't help anyone right you can take <laughs> all the backups in the world but if your backups are encrypted no one can help you you're you're dead in the water at that point uh so you need to make sure you have append only backups like there's a whole lot that goes into trying to not even protect against the initial attack but just to enable yourselves to recover uh it's it's a hard problem um is it doable Absolutely. People do it all the time. It happens every day. Uh, if I got hit with ransomware today, um, you know, I'd fire up the open source program Restic. I'd, I'd, you know, repool my home directory and I'd be done. Right. I'd be like, yeah, all right. That, that was annoying. It took a few hours out of my life. Um, but, you know, what are you going to do? I didn't lose a bunch of money over it. Uh, but for large institutions, that's, you know, that's not really easy to set up and get rolling in the first place. Um, it's it's just a difficult problem. So to combat this, you know, because you can't throw up your hands and say, well, I guess it's it's useless. We're we're just dead now. Um, instead, you start paying a bunch of insurance money to a, a cyber insurance company who says it's OK. You're going to get hit by ran ransomware. It'll happen one day. Uh, we're going to pony up the cash. You just have to keep paying us money every single month. Just just pay us a, a big deductible when you get hit. We'll give you the money for the ransom. We'll call it even. Your rates uh, will go up. Yeah. Your, yeah, your rates will go up. And then the problem is it may happen again. Like there's no guarantee that it won't happen again. And and you may say, okay, so what? The phones are down for a little bit. But if 911 is down, that's not good. If you can't get to the police department, that's not good. If they don't have records on people, I mean, that's not good. And you say, well, if they back up once a week, no, a lot happens in a week that need to be documented and, and analyzed and everything else. So th this idea that you do need something, and I really do like what the Microsoft approach is doing. This I really do like Office 365. So I was a big Google person, and we said, all oh, this, Google Drive. And for the most part, I'm still there, but Office 365, they have OneDrive built in and they're allowing you to use it and everything else. Same with iCloud Drive. It, 
backs up for you. You don't have to worry about it. And I think at least OneDrive does protect from ransomware. It's not cheap, but it does protect. I, I know that, um, you know, for instance, Dropbox, if your Dropbox gets, you know, hit with ransomware, uh, they've got versioning built in. You can go in and say, okay, hey, can you roll back this stuff to this point in time, right? Are you going to lose stuff between, um, you know, when when the, the version was cut and then when you got hit with ransomware? Yeah, probably, maybe. Depends on when it synced last. Uh, but... For the most part, you know, it's it's a fairly trivial recovery operation. Um, you know, modern file systems do have similar things. Now, clever ransomware is starting to get around that. So if you have enabled something like volume shadow copy on, on your Windows file systems, or uh, if you're taking ZFS snapshots, I don't know of ransomware that's targeting a ZFS snapshots specifically, but... Uh, Mark my words, it's a matter of time. Uh, but I know that some ransomware will actually disable volume shadow copy and delete all the versioning information contained in it and then start encrypting your file. So there's there's literally nothing you can do. Um, but volume shadow copy is, you know, kind of a good thing to enable anyway. Yeah, it's going to take some disk space. Yeah, you're going to have to configure it. Yeah, you're going to have to read up on this and, and try to, you know, get a beat on what it does and how it works. But... Um, if there's a chance that it could help you, uh, it's kind of a low cost, no cost solution to maybe dig yourself out of a hole. Again, I always tell people get yourself for personal use to whatever it is, a two terabyte West or whatever, the little USB three hard drives, put everything on there, do it once a month. Now this is personal. This is not business of your photos or whatever else. And then when you're not using it, literally disconnect it. And once a week, yes, it's not always, it's not going to be an always backup, but you will have it. And for you personally, losing a month's worth of work or a week's worth of work or whatever your time frame is will probably help you. You don't have to pay the ransomware. Now you just have to recreate that last week and hopefully you save some, you can get whatever you want, but now you have to make a decision. And that's the, that's always the thing with insurance. They'll pay out if it costs for the least amount of money. And uh, if, if you've got the option, you know, if, if you want to sort stuff in Dropbox and Google Drive and iCloud and OneDrive and whatever, that's fine. Do it. Uh, it's, it's probably, you know, especially if, if the cloud storage solution you have or you're using has a versioning, um, that's wonderful. It is just fantastic. Uh, and you should absolutely keep the important stuff there. Um, also, look into for personal use look into backup programs like don't don't back up your work laptop with mosey at home right you you are breaking so many terms of service agreements and your it people and your legal people are going to kill you because you've taken your company data and handed it to a weird company that they don't know about and haven't vetted right it's not a good idea but for your personal stuff mosey at home carbonite we've recommended them in the past um, there are plenty of backup products out there that will package up your stuff ship it off to the cloud and make sure it's append only that's great. Um, it's absolutely worth investing in backups. So, and again, somebody, there was a Twitter thread a few weeks ago, three things you will, the first three things you tell to an average person when it comes to securing their content. And I think mine was backup. I forgot number two. Number two was, number two was not pass. I think two was password managers and three was two factor authentication, but clearly passwords was number one. We're not passwords. Backup was number one. Yeah, backup for absolute sure. Uh, it's it's one of the things that you know back in the day working in a help desk. You know, if someone just had backups, like even if they didn't know how to recover something, but they had it saved somewhere, right? They had a program running at some point in time to back up the machine. Ever, uh, they would have saved them, themselves so much trouble. I worked at a college help desk, and I I saw a person lose their their you know phd term paper because their hard drive crapped out on them uh, and i i was doing everything i could to try to recover this because it was literally you know the the magnum opus of their educational life like that it, it was the most important document they had ever worked on uh, and possibly ever will work on uh and it was gone there was nothing i could do i could recommend a drive recovery service but you know that's like five grand and you might get it back hopefully uh but mm. there was nothing i could do from my end and it, it broke my heart oh here we go i found it backup auto update password manager and fourth 
non-SMS multi-factor authentication. And that should have been our topic because I forgot. I'm okay with all these things. All right. Well, no, our top. Well, our topic should be uh, Jack from Twitter. The Jack Dorsey from Twitter got royally owned last week and uh, got sim jacked and threw out a whole bunch of bad stuff on Twitter. And now they're disabling Twitter SMS. But anyway, but again, so those are the four things. None of them really had to do with security. The fact set up a backup. We've talked about this. Auto update, we talked about this at the beginning of the show. Password managers, that should be after you do those two and know how those two things work before you start moving. And once you get the password manager down, something non-SMS multi-factor authentication because I guess we're almost at the point that um, SIM jacking, where that means somebody calls a T-Mobile or at t and Verizon or Sprint and says, hey, I'm this person, I need a new SIM, and they can take all your information. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind on SIM jacking is that it's not a drive-by style attack, right? They're not like shotgunning out, at least not to my knowledge. They're not shotgunning out to try to get anyone. Um, they, you have to be specifically targeted. It is, it is a spear phishing expedition. Uh, if somebody is going after you, there's not a ton that you can do to try to protect yourself other than the stuff we've already shared. Um, and if SMS two-factor is your only option, it's better that it's there than it's not. Um, it's, it's certainly not ideal, not for a long shot, especially if you're in a position where you're going to be specifically targeted for an attack. Like if you're the CFO of a multi-billion dollar company, well, SMS two-factor authentication might not help you. Um, that said, it's better than not having any at all. So yeah, yeah put it, put a go. pin on your account, call, call customer service, put some notes in your account. It's not foolproof, right? People, people don't read the notes. They don't look at them. They ignore them. The, you know, social engineer on the other end will make up excuses like, oh, I know I did that and I forgot my pin and I didn't write it down and they could fool anyone in that chain. Um, but it's a little bit of extra insurance and maybe somebody's paying attention. So it's always good to look at it. So, well, anyway, again, 27 minutes in, I think we covered this as well as we could. If you're more interested in uh, the ransomware and everything else, I'll give you two websites. First is our WhatsApp group. Find us. We'll add you in. We can talk about it. The second one is bleeping computer. Because Bleeping Computer took the took the horns, took the reins, and they are focused, like their main thing that they do is writing about how to reverse crypto ransomware for what they can. It's not always, they can't always do it. it sometimes it takes a while, but as they find them, as they find different variants, they put them on and they try to do it. Problem is if you need something in 72 hours and they don't have it, I mean, you're kind of out of luck. But one of the things they try to do is keep a repository just just in case. So. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic resource. And really, even if you're just curious about ransomware and uh, how to crack or get around ransomware crypto, uh, some of them use broken crypto, some of them use not well-engineered crypto. Some of them, their servers got taken over by you know white hat hackers and the keys got released, and that's great for everyone. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how you have to work around some of these problems. So anyway, we'll leave you there because we're, I mean, we're out of time at this point. So next week, somebody better remind us, uh, Jack and his Twitter and uh, the spear fishing attack, because that is a topic that you need to at least be aware of. There's really nothing you can do, but at least be aware of how to protect yourself. So anyway, yep. um, I guess we will see you next, not next week, but probably the week after. Everyone have a good night. Bye. See everyone. Stop. All right. I have stopped the audacity. Okay. Uh, we are still streaming. Yep. I'm going to shut that off shortly.